Our New Testament lesson comes from Peter's first letter, the second chapter, verses 1 through 10. 1 Peter 2, 1 through 10. Listen for the word of God. Rid yourselves, therefore, of all malice and all guile, insincerity, envy, and all slander. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture... See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, he is precious. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner, and a stone that makes them stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Mercy. Here in the readings, let us pray. God of constant mercy, who sent your Son to save us, as we hear your word today, remind us of your goodness. Increase your grace within us that we may grow in thankfulness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Last February, Jean and I visited Myanmar, the country people of my generation called Burma. Only the last few years has it been open to tourists. After the British rulers left, a military junta took over and ruled with an iron hand, changing its name and closing it off to the outside world. Some of you will recall the name An Song, whose father worked to move the British out and then was mysteriously assassinated. An Song won the Nobel Peace Prize for her dedication to bringing democracy to the Burmese people. That is still a work in progress, as some reforms have come to the country, but the military is still the most influential player in the country's politics. Gene and I wanted to get to Myanmar before it became totally modernized, and we did. We took a boat down the country's main thoroughfare, the Irrawaddy River, stopping at towns and villages along the way. And one of the surprising elements was the proliferation of cell phones. Even though people did not enjoy indoor plumbing or electricity, they would construct a small solar panel on a pole in order to charge their cell phones. Another interesting aspect was the religious life of this Buddhist country. Like some other Southeast Asian nations, they have a tradition of all boys entering a Buddhist monastery. This is an open system in that one can at will go in and out of the monastery. A young boy might spend a week at age 6, a month at age 12, and maybe another couple of months as a teenager or young man. The purpose of these visits is to learn the basics of the Buddhist faith, but also to absorb lessons on hygiene, cultural manners, societal expectations. But the monasteries also serve as orphanages, institutions of higher learning, and vehicles for upward mobility. The monk robe clad children, four to ten years old, were most often either orphans or children from the countryside sent to the monastery so they could eat and, and obtain an education. 
If they decide to leave, they do so with knowledge that will enable them to find employment. Or if they stay in the monastery, they assume the revered status of one chosen for God's work. Now, it is easy for us to forget this is the way society functioned in Europe in the 16th century. Upward mobility traveled through the monasteries. Monasteries were the seats of learning. A school would be an extension of a monastery or convent, and their primary purpose was to train priests, monks, and brothers of religious orders. Now, of course, this is not strange to us. Harvard was founded to train Puritan pastors, Yale to raise up congregational clergy, and Princeton to produce Presbyterian ministers. Throughout America, the typical Presbyterian pattern was to found a church and then to build a school right beside it. But in the 16th century in Europe, if you were not born a king or nobleman, there were few paths up the social scale. Kings, nobles, and the landed gentry owned all the property. It was through the church that a person could find opportunity. At this time, theology was regarded as the queen of the sciences, and those who chose a religious vocation were viewed in a privileged light. First, they had received an education, knew how to read and write, and had access to books. And second, they were God's people on earth, specially chosen to perform the only work that really mattered. But the German reformer Martin Luther threw a wrench into all of this. He developed a doctrine called the priesthood of all believers. It declared that a person did not need a priest as the intermediary between him and God. We can go directly to God to confess our sins, receive God's grace. But another element of this doctrine was that not only are clergy called by God, but every person is called to live out a Christian life work to build God's kingdom in whatever profession or job he or she has chosen. Whatever honest work one performs, it is God-given, God-inspired, and an opportunity to help bring God's will. Now, this theological idea, this belief that came out of the Protestant Reformation, demands that as Christians, each of us, whether we have a job, are training for a job or looking to the day when we will begin our life work, we ask ourselves, do I want a job or a calling? Now, what's the difference? First, a job seeks to meet my needs. Food, shelter, car, health care, kids to college. A calling includes the needs of the of a job but also seeks to accomplish this for other people martin luther took the term vocation and moved it from the church cloister to the entire world of work he argued against the medieval idea that christians were divided into two groups sacred and secular rather he said all work is sacred Every job can be a calling. Luther noted that all baptized Christians are called to be priests, but not all are selected to be pastors. Now, an extension of this idea is why in the Presbyterian Church, not only do we ordain pastors, but lay people are ordained as elders. We believe both are called by God, but to different functions. Consequently, we believe we can be called by God to not only be ministers, but teachers, welders, doctors, mothers and fathers, business owners, custodians, lawyers, IT repair people, etc., etc., etc. Any job where our gifts are employed to make the world a better place can be a calling. I attended Asbury College for my undergraduate work, a small conservative institution that carried a rather specific religious orientation. But what I found interesting was that its graduates in fields such as teaching were highly sought after. And the reason was pretty simple. Teachers coming out of Asbury believed God had called them to be teachers. 
So they were committed to put their hearts and soul into their work to be the best teachers they could possibly be because they believed it was God's work they were performing. A job puts food on the table. A calling invites us to participate in the tapestry of God's desire for humanity. The story is told that St. Francis instructed one of his followers to go into a village and witness to the gospel. He said, preach the word. Use words if necessary. One day a man was asked if he was a Christian, and he replied, you'll need to ask my neighbors. A job is about me. A calling is about us. Second, the difference between a calling and a job is that a job seeks to change the world in a way I benefit. A calling seeks to transform the world to look like Christ. We believe all Christians receive gifts from God to be used in God's service. Some people are better at mass. Some are, can express a more compassionate spirit. Some are given physical beauty. Uh, others can do anything with their hands. Whatever one's talents and everyone possesses them, they are truly gifts. Now these days, the word sacrifice is not very popular. We live in a me-first culture, but the Christian faith disputes that orientation. There is a reason a cross hangs in our sanctuary. Jesus gave his life so that you and I might be forgiven of our sins. His sacrifice brought salvation and purpose-filled lives to every one of us. The concept of sacrifice stands at the core of our Christian faith. We are God's hands and feet here on earth. Our work becomes a part of our calling, our efforts to help bring the kingdom of God here on earth. Our jobs are not separate from our Christian faith, but a part of it, an important part. A calling seeks to exemplify a Christ-like life in our jobs. A calling nice not only what is good for me, but what is good for my fellow workers, my patients, my parishioners, my clients, my business partners. And sometimes, what is best for everyone else is not what is best for me. And that is where sacrifice comes into play. The Christian sees his job, his work, as a platform to live like Jesus. We take the gifts God has so generously provided us, nurture and enhance them so they may be employed in accomplishing God's will here on earth. There was a grandmother struggling with a life-threatening illness who had her little granddaughter with her on Christmas. The granddaughter was watching as her grandmother lit a candle and placed it in the window. Grandma, the little girl, asked, why do we like candles on Christmas? And the grandmother replied, we like candles on Christmas, my dear, to tell the darkness we beg to differ. In our jobs, we will be confronted with ego, greed, malice, a host of attitudes and actions proclaiming that a gospel of love, forgiveness, and sacrifice is not relevant. When our job becomes a calling, where we seek to transform the world in the image of Christ, we are telling one and all, we beg to differ.
last. A job produces results that don't matter much one way or another. A calling produces eternal consequences. A job can be viewed as something that must be endured. My performance may determine how much money is made or how efficient the office is, but in the scheme of things, the impact is negligible. But in a calling, every conversation, every transaction is an opportunity to display the love of Christ, a chance to portray to other people that I value them as children of God and what they do as a part of God's work here on earth. A calling realizes that how I perform my work influences other people, everything from their financial well-being to their ability to progress in their calling. A calling takes seriously the belief that this is God's world, and therefore everything we do affects God's will, and that means it has eternal consequences for God's people. How I treat people of other races and religions matters. My honesty witnesses to my faith. My compassion, my helpfulness tells someone how much I value who they are and what they do. Listening to my patients, parishioners, co-workers, my fellow students tells them they are important. How we perform our work, whatever that work is, testifies to whether we believe Christ is a partner in all we do and say. And those transactions, those conversations, those decisions that are performed at work have an impact on people's lives, causing them to make decisions that have eternal consequences for them and their families. A job is just a means of survival. A calling changes lives. On New Year's Eve 1913, a shot rang out. A boy was playing with a pistol and he was taken by police and put into a house of correction called the Colored Waifs Home for Boys. His behavior there was so difficult that the director, John Peter Davis, decided to try quieting him by handing him a trumpet. Exchanging the metal of the revolver for the metal of the instrument, 12-year-old Louis Armstrong coaxes from the trumpet the first notes of a legendary career. A calling performs its work with the belief that our actions, large and small, carry the potential for earthly and eternal consequences. Do you want a job or a calling? Protestant Reformation ushered in the concept of the priesthood of all believers, the theological idea that no, that no one needs an intermediary between them and God. But another part of this idea enunciated the knowledge that when it comes to vocation, all Christians are called to portray Christ in their lives, that when it came to employment, there was no distinction between sacred and secular. Therefore, every Christian should view his chosen employment or job as a calling from God. Unlike a job that seeks only to benefit me, a calling looks to be a, a vehicle to benefit all people, seeks to transform the world to look like Jesus, realizes that how I conduct myself at work has both earthly and eternal consequences for me and for others. This morning, do you believe can you see how your job can be, is a calling, a method to help bring God's kingdom to earth? Today, 
do you want a job or a calling?